in this program, the biggest loser is really the biggest winner. They've lost more weight and are on their way to health and wellness because health is totally just a number on a scale, right? Well, that's definitely not the truth, but the Biggest Loser TV show insists that they really care about their contestants and they're just here to help. Plus, there's no arguing with their incredible results. People go on the show saying they've lost relationships with their family members because of their size, only to leave looking like a totally different person. Even former Olympic athletes say it's devastating what they've become and appear on the program to lose weight. Surely they wouldn't go on a show if it was a bad idea. Throughout these seasons, some contestants lose hundreds of pounds. Cutting your body weight in half is like unheard of essentially. Like it's insane to watch those kinds of transformations. It's practically commonplace on this program though. And some of the before and after photos featured in health magazines seem surreal. Others use a different word to describe it, inspiring. In 2009, five years after the program first aired, viewers continued to use the program to motivate themselves to work out and lose weight. Some claimed that their local gym would run contests like the Biggest Loser program, offering a trip to whichever team loses the most weight. Others said that them and their friends created their own contest, and another poster said their workplace held one. As for the inspiration that the TV contestants have, they get motivation from their team leaders and show hosts like Jillian Michaels. But her goal isn't just to help you. No, she wants to break you. That's how Jillian herself has phrased it. After you break him, you will establish dominance. With Greg, basically, I just hammer him into the ground. Ten more. Puke, and then hop on a treadmill. I'm gonna go break another one of them. Okay? Okay. She pushes people so they can see how strong they are, hammers contestants into the ground, and tells them that they can get off their treadmill if they throw up. Then when one contestant, Greg, did vomit, Jillian said she was proud of herself. Others on the team watching were frightened, concerned for Greg and their own well-being. but what choice do they have to keep going when Jillian threatens to break bones? Greg, if you don't run, I will pull Alex on the floor and I will break every bone in his body. Don't worry though, Jillian says they're just throwing up because they have toxins in their body. Granted, she's also said that she doesn't care if people die on the gym floor, they better die looking good and that it's fun watching other people suffer. It's motivational to the extreme, but when does motivation become dangerous? Studies show that shaming people doesn't help them lose weight either. So why does this seem to be Jillian's method? The thing is, it's no secret that many Americans are overweight or obese. And the Cleveland Clinic argues that plenty who are don't fully understand the risk to their heart health. Now that's not to say that you shouldn't love the skin you're in regardless of size. As Dr. Stanford, an instructor of medicine at Harvard Med School put it, a person can feel good about themselves while still making changes to be healthy. Quote, your weight doesn't need to define your happiness. But is The Biggest Loser really coming from this place of health? Or are they just shaming contestants into shedding pounds? And does Jillian or the other hosts actually want people to suffer? And would they really hurt someone for the sake of weight loss? Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're obviously talking about the show, The Biggest Loser. Now to start with, I wanna get into what the program offers and what we see on the surface. And yes, that includes what some call televised abuse from trainers like Bob Harper and Jillian Michaels. You might be asking, why would anyone tolerate this? Well, for a quarter of a million dollar prize money, of course. Now, the premise is pretty simple. Lose the most weight, gain the most cash. That's a life-changing amount of money without a doubt, so contestants are naturally going to feel pressured to stick it out, even if that means enduring grueling and potentially abusive treatment. We'll get into what former contestants have said in just a moment, but first, let's take a deeper look at how The Biggest Loser actually treats health. Now, all the way back in 2009, a few years after they first premiered, the New York Times published an article with the headline, On The Biggest Loser, Health Can Take a Back Seat. And that's probably one of the last things you'd want to hear from a program about weight loss and health. Isn't health supposed to be the point? The New York Times wrote that the winner of the first season, Ryan Benson, went onto the program weighing 330 pounds and left 133 pounds lighter, only to return to 300 plus pounds a few years later. So no, that's not a great look for the program, but it was his speaking out about being dehydrated to the point of urinating blood that he thinks got him shunned from the program. Yet more and more people sign up, losing more and more weight at rapid paces. I think many of us can generally agree that reality TV producers feel like they always have to have something ridiculous or outrageous happening to hold on to ratings. It's kind of like just reality TV show clickbait in that way. The trouble is when you mix this with a weight loss program, you're bound to get a really dangerous pairing. 
Making strange or ridiculous challenges just for the sake of it is one thing. That belongs on a program like The Floor is Lava, where you have professional athletes running through obstacle courses. But on The Biggest Loser? Well, it's kind of no wonder you're gonna have broken bones and people fainting. Yet despite diet having a bigger impact on weight loss than exercise according to countless studies, I guess it's just way funnier to watch people run around random obstacle courses with no experience or training than eat healthy and speak with a nutritionist. At times, it seemed like The Biggest Loser has recognized that they've been unsafe. During a mile long foot race at the beginning of season eight, for example, two competitors collapsed and were hospitalized. The show's director, Rob Huizanga, told the New York Times that, quote, if we had to do over, we wouldn't do it. Unfortunately, the show's clearly all talk. They did the exact same challenge, a mile run, at the start of season 12 and added an advantage for the winning team. Rob, you did get a do-over every single new season and you changed nothing. Just wanna remind you of what you said. Now, some contestants told tabloids that they had stress fractures and passed out during taping. Unsurprisingly, others said that The Biggest Loser effectively gave them an eating disorder. Kai Hibbard said the pressure to keep the weight off was so extreme that she had an unhealthy mindset surrounding food and weight afterwards. Dr. Robert Kushner, a professor of medicine at Northwestern's Memorial Hospital in Chicago, said that Hibbard, quote, represents a group of individuals who develop eating disorders during a competition to lose weight because psychologically, they are getting so much praise and admiration from other people that they'll do anything to sustain their weight. If they put it back on there would be embarrassment and a sense of failure. Now, after a family staged intervention, Hibbert started to recover as well as meet with a therapist and nutritionist. And if you've watched any of my episodes for any amount of time, then you'll know what I'm about to say. Why wasn't she meeting with one in the first place? If The Biggest Loser wanted to make an impact and help people in the long term, then they should have had therapists on the program, as well as nutritionists, more doctors, and as well as exercise coaches. Yet a YouTube search for Therapist Biggest Loser results in therapists reacting to the program, whereas Biggest Loser Challenge results in a massive list of random, extreme, pull your weight, spotlight racing, and 24-hour challenges. How do these challenges spark long-term weight loss anyway? It's definitely not like you can do that at home. And I doubt these contestants have ice skating rinks and angled walls. But getting to the root of binge eating disorders or potential health issues, now that would actually be helpful and informational for the public too, might I add. But once again, when you take that second look at the show, it's clear that they're after ratings more so than having these meaningful conversations. And hey, there's nothing wrong with being entertaining, but when it's packaged as healthy and helpful, that's where I start to have a problem. Not to mention, it's crucial that if someone loses this much weight on The Biggest Loser, that they do have to refrain from their old eating habits for their own safety. Have you ever heard of something called refeeding syndrome? As Dr. Ed Tyson told The Guardian, it's a potentially fatal shift in fluids and electrolytes when malnourished people start to eat again. He told them, quote, it's miraculous no one has died yet in reference to the program, but unfortunately it gets worse and abusive on a whole other level. Now, when I say the word abusive, I don't mean tough love that trainers may give insisting that you do one more push up or shouting words of encouragement or even degradation if that's maybe what you signed up for too. It goes a little bit beyond that. In 2013, Jillian Michaels found herself at the center of a scandal involving caffeine pills. Without the permission of the show's doctor, Jillian gave each member of her team caffeine pills. This gave her a disadvantage on the contest itself. And Jillian made a statement when she was caught saying, I stand by my opinion. A caffeine supplement is significantly healthier than unlimited amounts of coffee. My only regret is that my team, they're the ones suffering the consequences of my professional opinion. I just want you to notice how there's no apology or acknowledgement that a rule was broken here. Instead, the program seems to spin it as, hey, this isn't a big deal because the pills she was giving them only had 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is less than a Starbucks tall coffee, which is about 260 milligrams. Even exercise physiologist, Sean Foy, said that caffeine can enhance some workouts and he still respected Jillian. His main concern was that he didn't want audience members to think that if they take a pill to fix things and keep their energy levels high, that this would amount to a long-term solution because it doesn't. Now, I'm not about to sit here and say that caffeine is the devil, the ultimate evil, whatever you wanna call it. Even in my old episodes that I've talked about caffeine, I don't say that, but it is something we should be careful with, especially if you're a trainer insisting that your team members take them. Instead, I'd argue that the concerning bit here is the message of taking a pill to fix something. It's that Jillian Michaels acts as if her advice should trump the word of a medical professional because she thinks she knows better. Plus again, Even if a contestant was wary, the potential for earning hundreds of thousands of dollars might sway someone against their better judgment. 
Personally, if there's going to be money involved here, and this is a reality TV show, so of course there is, I don't think it should be based on who lost the most weight since that's not a consistent determiner of health in the first place. It gets worse than caffeine pills offered by Jillian though. Contestant Joelle Gwynn said that the show's doctor had her taking allegedly illicit pills on the program just a few years after the caffeine pill scandal. It's not clear what these pills were, but Gwynn told the New York Post, quote, I felt jittery and hyper. I went and told the sports medicine guy. The next day, Dr. H gave us the lame explanation of why they got added to our regimen and that it was up to us to take them. People chastise Bill Crosby for allegedly offering meds to women, but it's acceptable to do that to fat people to make them lose weight. I feel like we get raped too. And for the record, the New York Post isn't exactly a reputable source here, but I wanted to quote Gwen's words exactly and tell you where I got those words from. Now, the thing is, if you're taking weight loss pills with the conscious knowledge of what they are and what they're going to do, talk to your doctor. That's up for you guys to decide. The sick thing here is that Gwen was seemingly pressured to take them and dismissed when she did report side effects. Hollywood Reporter writes that the pills were allegedly reported to be yellow and black, like the FDA banned drug ephedra. The show, from its producers to trainers to doctors, have denied these allegations for the record. But if this is the case and Gwen was really given ephedra, that's all kinds of fucked up. Like seriously, forget about breaking reality TV show rules. The year before this story broke in 2016, Reuters was reporting how ephedra poisoning cases were climbing and how dangerous the pill can be. Does this mean that the biggest loser's doctor is so unaware of the drugs that he's giving patients that he didn't know the risk or that they were simply willing to push that risk onto someone else? Now I'm not 100% sure, but neither one of those options look good if the allegations are true. But it's okay. Remember what the biggest loser said earlier. They care about people. They just want to help. It's not their fault if contestants are taking amphetamines, water pills, diuretics, and making themselves throw up in the bathroom to try and lose the most weight and get that cash. Frankly, even if it wasn't the biggest loser directly telling contestants to take pills or that it's good to vomit, they created a dangerous atmosphere and may have hurt even more than they helped. I'd love to say that the contestants believed the shit they endured was worth it. Like, yeah, maybe they felt sick, they vomited, they cried, lost their fricking marbles over this, but it was all worth it because now they're happy and healthy. A few months of torture is nothing compared to years of health and joy, right? Wrong. That's not the case at all. And on so many different levels. We'll start with the first one. And that's the absolute shame and humiliation many of these contestants endured and endured publicly. Rachel Fredrickson, for example, had a big reveal at the end of season 15. She stepped onto the stage having lost the majority of her body weight. And as many were quick to point out, she was thin. Now, when viewers watched her, they said she looked quote, anorexic, whereas before she'd been shamed for being obese. There was no winning for her. She'd been shamed for being overweight. And now she was being shamed for losing that weight. But those are the viewers. That's not the program's fault. Well, let's look at what the program did. According to Kai Hibbard, who we mentioned earlier, The show would pick winners and villains as many reality TV shows do. Yet some of the villains of the show weren't mean people at all. Hibbard claimed that one of the women, Heather, that the program made to look like, quote, combative lazy bitch, in actuality had a torn calf and had developed bursitis in both knees. They tried to make her run. And when she refused, the show portrayed it as laziness. Now, not only is this so fucking obnoxious to do to Heather, but it doesn't help anyone that's struggling to lose weight. It sends the message to viewers that some overweight people are just lazy and don't care enough to take care of themselves when that's a stereotype that really doesn't need any reinforcing. Heather was injured, plain and simple. Not running because of a torn calf muscle is a damn good reason to take a break and to know your limits. Terry, on the other hand, suffered a broken bone and pushed herself to continue. She was made to look like a hero, so determined and brave. And while yeah, her determination is admirable, it doesn't seem fair that someone who pauses to take a breather so they don't risk further injury is bitchy, seemingly without the show bothering to explain why, while someone who does push through is a hero. Like, please know your limits, listen to your doctor's orders and listen to your body. And yet there's still more damage that's been done here. And some of it is permanent. One study published in 2012 sought to understand why the Biggest Loser contestants put on weight so quickly. Apparently, it's not just because the show failed to teach about long-term weight loss, even though I'd guess that's part of the reason, but because their metabolisms were damaged. The show's contestants were compared to those who have gastric bypass surgery. While they did lose more fat and less muscle than surgery recipients, their drop in resting metabolic rate was double, AKA they were starved to reach those low weights. And by the time their body started eating again, their metabolisms had crashed. Contestants say that this is the real reason that The Biggest Loser doesn't do reunions because they're quote, all fat again. It's apparently an unspoken but obvious fact among those that go on the program, but they're discouraged from talking about it or disparaging the show. 
Granted, while these contestants told the New York Post, not the most reputable sources I know, but it doesn't seem like there were that many sources discussing this topic at all, unfortunately. Instead, reputable people promoted the program like Michelle Obama, who appeared on it twice. Slowly but surely though, people questioning The Biggest Loser gained traction. In 2016 and around this era, more and more articles came out wondering how healthy the program actually is. Trainers said that they turned down the program for ethical reasons, and more studies came out against The Biggest Loser. Not only the ones about metabolism, but some studies actually said that the program generated significantly higher levels of dislike for people with obesity. And make no mistake, people have been talking about this since the beginning, even if they weren't always heard. The winner of the 2005 season, Ryan Benson, actually started his own program to talk about his problems since The Biggest Loser, like regaining weight. According to Ryan, he couldn't stick to the show's extremely high standard and he slipped back into his old habits. He took his second chance though and started to lose the weight in a healthy way from the looks of things. The former executive producer of The Biggest Loser is even the one helping him, along with several other former Biggest Loser contestants. And in my opinion, this reflects so poorly on the program. The more contestants that come out and say, hey, I gained more weight and I feel terrible, the more it proves that their way simply does not work. Like, listen, it's one thing to have a couple of people say it didn't work for them because that's statistically possible. But when there's an entire reality show seemingly dedicated to fixing the mistakes of another reality TV show, that's a bit asinine. Are some contestants bound to get a bit heavier? Yes, weight does fluctuate. But studies from Scientific American have less than 10% of contestants able to actually keep the weight off. Only one of the former 14 contestants haven't gained weight, just one. And as all of this information came out, the biggest loser started to plummet. Jillian Michaels was finally fired from the program, which according to one source was because of her criticism of Rachel's massive loss. Rachel already had people dogpiling her, saying she looked anorexic and making those ridiculously unnecessary comments. I guess it finally became too much when a coach joined in. The studies, the criticism, the former contestants saying it didn't work for them, all of it culminated in the show being canceled. Hell, even Jillian herself eventually spoke out against how the program was run as a contestant and said that the show needed a mental health professional, but I find it pretty hard to take her critique seriously when she contributed to the problem so massively. So yeah, Jillian, some of those contestants probably did need therapy to help them work through their emotional problems or even binge eating disorders. If you knew that, why did you mock them for vomiting? Anyway, it's clear that contestants have been harmed in some capacity through this program. So it's a great thing it's dead, right? Well, not really, because this program has been dragged from the grave where it belongs and resuscitated. And unfortunately, it's not just doing harm to the people that appear on the program, but misleading the people that watch it too. And before we get into some of these lasting aftershock effects of The Biggest Loser, I'm just gonna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. Research shows that sex is as mental as it is physical. So you need more than just an amazing vibrator. If you dog-eared that one sexy chapter in a romance novel, or you have that particular scene in a movie that you always fantasize about, Dipsy can help you get there in a new way. With Dipsy, you can skip straight to the good parts. And that's because Dipsy is the app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. Find stories about an intriguing coworker or hooking up with a hot yoga instructor. Whatever's your flavor, they've probably got you covered. New content is released every week. So in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. And Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and sexy stories you can read too. So let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax and unwind, or heat things up with a partner. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash casket. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipseastories.com slash casket, dipsystories.com slash casket. The Biggest Loser is as misleading as any other reality program. The way they've portrayed people that are injured perpetuates the harmful stereotype that overweight people are always lazy and the way they depict losing weight is far from accurate. Do contestants allegedly lose a lot of weight by effectively starving themselves? They do, but two pounds a day or more each week, that's not realistic. One week on the show can be multiple weeks of filming, about three weeks according to Hibbard. So losing 17 pounds in three weeks still isn't healthy. It's still about three times as much as what's considered healthy weight loss by medical professionals but at least it's not eight to 17 times as much, I guess. Unfortunately, with the return of The Biggest Loser comes the return of their fundamentally toxic setup, as The Atlantic puts it. They claim to have a holistic 360 degree look at wellness now, 
just like the pivot we saw Weight Watchers take recently, or whatever, WW. Sure, it's great if these brands actually care about health as opposed to numbers on a scale, but should they really be given a second chance? Have they earned that after the harm they caused? According to The Atlantic, the answer is a resounding no. They still have massive weigh-ins for extended periods of time, and there's still very little attention paid to food whatsoever. For a show that's now all about wellness, you'd think The Biggest Loser would at least attempt to keep their word and discuss nutrition or more aspects of getting healthy, but that really doesn't seem to be the case. Instead, and interestingly enough, this article accuses them of fetishizing workout culture as much as ever. One contestant, Kat, a cardiac nurse, by the way, told her trainer, Erica, that she felt lightheaded. Yet this medical professional was told to keep pushing and that if people were puking, they aren't working hard enough. But The Atlantic does give them credit for one thing, and I quote, "'Despite all this, the show can be useful if only because it's illustrative of how fundamentally broken American attitudes towards health can be.'" So congratulations to The Biggest Loser. You truly are, as a program, The Biggest Loser. The only thing they're good for is demonstrating what not to do to the fullest extent. Losing weight and health are not mutually exclusive, and they aren't about exercising to the point of vomiting or harming yourself. The program celebrates unhealthy habits, starvation, and shaming bigger bodies instead of encouraging people to talk to professionals. And, you know, also the whole thing of attaining health in a way that's sustainable and long lasting. So please, if one thing I can imbue onto you today, don't watch The Biggest Loser. It won't teach you healthy habits. It probably won't help these contestants in the long run either. Studies have shown time and time again, the harm that this show has caused, whether it's through the metabolism or because people watching it end up developing negative attitudes towards obese people. Clearly, this program isn't doing much good for anyone except the people that stand to make a profit from it. I hope this program goes off the air again, and this time, I hope it stays off. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm ending today's episode of The Corporate Casket and the last Corporate Casket of the year. Now, knowing that, you know, the new year, new me stuff is on its way, and obviously I am talking about weight loss and stuff like that. If that is part of your goal in 2023, just remember to be safe and be healthy about it. You only have one life, right? And if you've messed this one up for you because you've totally blown your metabolism trying to lose money on a TV show that literally could not really give a shit about you, just think about it for more than a second. I know weight is a really important thing to a lot of folks. I get it, I'm with you too. But just remember that you're still a person at the end of the day and you need to take care of yourself. I'm someone who totally forgets to like take care of myself a lot. And now as I'm kind of getting older, I'm feeling the effects of it. So I'm just saying, especially if you're a younger listener and you're looking to lose weight, please be safe about it. Take your time doing it slowly, is really the better way to do it. Was it slow and steady wins wins the race, something like that? Do that, don't rush into it. I know it can be exciting to watch numbers on the scale drop out of nowhere, but please be safe and take care of yourself. And with all that being said, that's the end of today's episode. I hope you have a great New Year's Eve if you're celebrating or doing anything, and I'll see you guys in the next year. Bye.